Hello, I'm Tom Rand. Uh, ever since the 1970s, when the Club of Rome first talked about or warned of potential limits to growth, debate about economic growth has focused on innovation versus scarcity. On one side, optimists would argue that markets combined with innovation would replace something when it gets scarce with something else, because it would rise in price and innovation would find another alternative. Pessimists would point at the unforgiving mass of an ever-expanding economy in a finite world and simply argue you cannot innovate your way out of the laws of nature. Until now, this has been a very interesting and somewhat philosophical debate, the jury on which I would argue is still out. But climate disruption, as a modern variant on a recurring theme, is different. It's different because it's happening in real time and is a practical problem to solve in real time, which brings a different dynamic, a point to which I will soon return. So modern optimists, clean tech bulls, would argue that clean energy innovation will mitigate climate risk. We won't stop climate change, we'll mitigate it, we will adapt to it, and it will be a bump on the road to continued economic growth. Modern pessimists, on the other hand, believe that climate disruption threatens economic growth itself. This is not a bump on the road to economic growth. This is the end of that road. And so the 21st century, the carbon vote bowls versus the uh, climate bear is a fight in which we all have a stake. Well, the climate, the carbon, uh, the clean tech bowls look strong. $250 billion was spent on clean energy last year. That figure is growing. It's expected to grow to about a trillion dollars by 2020. Public companies in the space, their valuations have rocketed 50% last year. Clearly, clean energy is scaling quickly. And I'm going to argue that many clean energies available to us today do not need subsidies. Clean tech is all grown up and ready to play with the big boys. Solar, in particular, has uh, reached an inflection point. It has a drop in price by three quarters since 2008. 37 gigawatts was installed last year. A gigawatt is the equivalent of a large nuclear or coal plant. 45 gigawatts is being installed this year. Government subsidies are largely going away. The training wheels are off this fledgling industry. All fledgling industries had training wheels at some point. Clean tech is no different. Rooftop solar in particular is on a tear as it competes against the retail cost of electricity. So much solar is going up on so many rooftops that big energy incumbents, big utilities in the United States and Australia are worried about their very business model. They're beginning to fight back. The Koch brothers are beginning to fund some of that fight back. In other words, the big guys, the incumbents, are worried, which is a good thing. Large-scale solar farms are beginning to compete with the wholesale cost of electricity. Canada's own Morgan Solar will be in the market this year with solar energy at five cents per kilowatt hour at scale. That is a highly disruptive price point that will give any fossil fuel a run for its money. Next up is energy storage. Canada's own HydroStore, underwater compressed air energy storage, building two systems right now, one in Toronto for Toronto Hydro and one in Aruba. The one in Aruba will store wind energy that's, that's, that's produced all night long and release it during the day. As far as I can tell, this is the lowest cost grid scale energy storage system on the planet. It's Canadian. The kicker is if you combine wind with HydroStore, you can today, without subsidies, beat diesel generation almost anywhere. No subsidies. Biofuels are beginning to kick into gear. Woodland biofuels, another Canadian star, can produce cellulosic ethanol, a gasoline replacement, from wood chips and agricultural waste, cheaper than the gasoline replacements. As a matter of fact, they will be the lowest cost liquid hydrocarbon producer in North America with their first commercial plant. So clearly, innovation can step up. But what are the, what are the clean tech bulls up against? Well, at 0.8 degrees, the bear is waking up, and we can already hear it growling. We are beginning to see a pattern emerge. The kind of droughts and storms, of biblical proportions have been occurring in Australia, the extended drought in California, these are but opening shots in this fight. They are nothing compared to what the climate bear has in store. According to BP and Exxon's own numbers, we can expect to blow past four degrees this century. The International Energy Agency, an extremely conservative group, pegs it at somewhere between four and six degrees Celsius this century. They are not prone to exaggeration. They are one of the most conservative energy advisory groups on the planet with no motivation to, to exaggerate the threat of climate change. 
Think of all that added heat as energy. We are adding the equivalent of 400,000 Hiroshima bombs to the atmosphere every day. That is an awful lot of energy for the climate there to make use of in wreaking havoc on our infrastructure. That is not the kind of situation that our economy grows through. That is the kind of situation that we will fight to survive in. So the question is not whether or not innovation can compete with fossil fuels. It clearly can. There are many other examples besides the ones that I've given you today. The question is, will it scale up fast enough to wrestle down the climate there? And that's why climate disruption is a new variant on a recurring theme. We have to replace something before it is scarce. If we are to stop anywhere near two degrees, the energy incumbents who have known reserves sitting on their balance sheets have to leave three quarters of those reserves roughly in the ground. Now, if I was an energy incumbent and I'm spending money to explore for new reserves, I don't care if you can only burn a quarter of existing reserves or a half. We can argue about that until the cows come home. New reserves, additional reserves, are 100% unburnable. So if I was an investor in an energy incumbent, and that energy incumbent was investing money to find new reserves, I would argue that's a, a breach of fiduciary obligation. You are spending capital to increase my carbon risk. Now how we respond to this problem depends on a lot of it. Our bulls need some steroids. And we've talked ad nauseum about what those steroids look like. A fee on carbon, green bonds to accelerate capital flows, yada, yada, yada. I'm interested in the role of the energy incumbents. They could be the hero of this story. Our job in the clean tech sector is to deliver technologies, new low carbon assets for energy companies to develop. Morgan Solar Plants have an internal rate of return in excess of 33%. A Woodland Commercial Ethanol Plant has a rate of return in excess of 25%. These are better deals than oil or gas deals. Now, an energy incumbent simply has to decide they are an energy player, not a fossil fuel player, and they can be a hero of the story. What's stopping Suncor from being a hero of the story? It's certainly not a financial argument. Low carbon assets are here and ready to go. It's habits of mind. You made a bunch of money yesterday, you're making a bunch of money today, what do you think I'm going to do tomorrow? That's a habit of mind. I've argued there's a fiduciary obligation. I can also argue there is a good financial uh, or motivation to move into low-carbon space. When we normally talk about limits and references to the Club of Rome, this is met with derision by most mainstream economists, as if it's some sort of Malthusian throwback by an unsophisticated Luddite who doesn't really understand innovation. The irony is, we've been using fossil fuels for almost two centuries now. I think the Luddites are on that side of the fence. It's not really a question of whether innovation can step up and solve this problem. It can. It will be difficult. It will be a long road to hope. It will take a long time. It will take a lot of effort. But we can do it. Whether or not we do do it depends largely, in my mind, on the attitude of the energy incumbents. They can help or they can hinder. And if they help, we can probably solve this problem. It's not the strength of the bulls that keeps me up at night. The bulls are healthy. What keeps me up at night is the strength of the bear. Thanks very much. Thank you.